It is now time for question period, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. Yesterday, another expert advisor from the government's COVID-19 public health table ex expressed frustration with the government's ineffective and incoherent public health measures and expressed concern uh, that he and other experts were forced to sign gag orders, preventing them from sharing their advice and concerns with the public. Is there any other reason the Premier slapped a gag order on expert advisers, or is it just as it appears that he doesn't want the public to know that he was actually ignoring their advice? Uh. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health to reply. In fact, there are no such gag orders. No one's forced to sign anything on the public health measures table. We've been very uh, Frank, with, with the people of Ontario, very transparent with the information that they've been provided. We are there every day for press conferences. Dr. Williams appears twice a week. We present the modelling table, all of the information that we have, the public has, and all of you have as well. So there's no question that uh, the people who are at the public health measures table um, come forward willingly. They provide their advice, and we're very grateful for that. Supplementary question. Bad news for the Minister and for uh, the Premier, Speaker. People know very well that this government is not being frank and transparent, and here's the problem that that, that uh, creates for families. The Premier has already been caught claiming that expert uh, advisers backed his plans when those experts actually thought it was reckless and indefensible, the plan that the Premier put in place. COVID-19 is impacting li the lives of everyone in this province, and they have a right to the same information that the Premier sees uh, when it comes to their health, their safety, their family's health, their family's safety. And they have a right to know when he, in fact, is ignoring that advice, Speaker. So will the Premier end the gag order and make all advice provided to Cabinet public today? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. In fact, we have been very transparent with the people of Ontario since this pandemic began. The Premier has said on a number of occasions that what we know, we want everyone else to know so people will understand why the decisions are being made that are being made. I think it's also very important to note that the members of the public health measures table have not signed as the member calls them, the gag orders or non-disclosure agreements, but there is a, a, a code of compliance that when you have a group of people that are making decisions like this, that they have one representative that speaks for them. That happens with many uh, uh, Public, both public and private companies, and, in, and uh, in addition to other communities and committees that report. So it's not. It's important that one person speaks for the entire group. We hear the advice from the public Response. health measures table, and we hear that through Dr. Williams. That's the way that the system works, and that's the process that we've been following throughout. The final supplementary. Transparency should have been the goal, but it's painfully obvious that it is not the goal of this government. They are not being transparent. The Premier insists that every decision made by the government is backed by his Chief Medical Officer of Health, but every day it gets harder and harder to believe that assertion. The Ford government's cutbacks in public health protections as the second wave was surging, the setting of ridiculously high thresholds for the red zone, uh, long-term care homes that were left vulnerable yet again, and the refusal to cap classroom sizes. So my question is, did the Premier, uh, did, rather did Dr. Williams tell the Premier uh, that he should be doing these things, or in fact did the Premier decide to do these things and order Dr. Williams to justify them? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Dr. Williams is an independent officer. He has the ability to make his own decisions, which he has done. And we have relied on the science and the clinical evidence throughout in every decision that we've made. And not only have we relied on that with the decisions that we've made, but we've put the money behind it. We've put billions of dollars into our COVID response, $2.8 billion most recently. We're putting over a billion dollars in testing, tracing, and isolating cases, and we're continuing to put more money into it. Because as the Premier said, the most important issue here is the health and well-being of the people of Ontario. That is our number one priority, always has been and always will be. 
Next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you, Speaker. I think the, uh, my next question is also, is also for the Premier, but I think the, uh, the Minister and this government have to realize that that certainly is not what it looks like to the families of the 11 people that died in long-term care yesterday. Right. The Ford government's failure to act is having a devastating impact on long-term care again. After the pandemic's first wave, frontline staff and home operators pleaded with this government to aggressively recruit staff to meet the demands of the second wave. Yet while other provinces, in fact, aggressively recruited staff engaged in really quite robust uh, campaigns to get more people on staff, the Ford government says that their staffing plan won't even be ready this year. Oh. Honestly, Speaker, it's tragic, and it's tra a tragedy that could have been avoided. Will the Premier make public today any advice from Dr. Williams or any members of the health table that support the decision not to staff up in long-term care? Minister of Long-Term Care to respond. Thank you, Speaker. First of all, my uh, concerns, my condolences go out to everyone who's been impacted by this, but your characterization of what has been going on in long-term care in terms of the staffing is, 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 is fabrication, and I'm going to be absolutely clear. I'm yep. going to ask the member to withdraw the unparliamentary comment and ask the member to, to make her comments through the chair. Thank you. So, we have been taking decisive action from the very beginning, using every resource possible, putting our policies in place and putting dollars behind it. Initially, the $243 million to shore up our, our staffing, our IPAC support for the homes, that was done immediately, swift and decisively. Uh, the process of staffing uh, planning was ongoing, not only for the crisis that was left behind by the previous government and supported by, by you, uh, as well as the $540 million that we announced in October to make sure our homes had, had dollars for IPAC staffing and the wardrooms that were completely neglected uh, under the previous government. No, re no significant Response. redevelopment was ever done. We have been at this. We will continue to do everything possible. We are committed to the safety and well-being of residents and staff in long-term care, and we will continue. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, perhaps the minister is unaware, but in today's Huffington Post, staff at a for-profit facility in Scarborough ravaged by COVID-19 say that they are chronically short-staffed and forced to go back and forth between the positive and uh, COVID positive and COVID negative floors because there are so few of these wow. staff in the home. In July, the government's own expert panel own expert panel on staffing urgently urgently recommended a minimum standard of 4 hours of daily hands-on care for every resident in long-term care yet the government refused to act for months and months and months while covid returned to long-term care homes so will the premier make public today any advice from dr williams or any members of the health tables that supported that decision mm. To reply, Mr. Long -term Care. Thank, you. thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. The decisions that are being made in long-term care to support our homes have been ongoing in an unprecedented global situation to understand everything that can be done, not only learning from the previous uh, wave, wave one, but learning from other countries. It is continuous. It is involving public health, Ontario health, our integration with our hospitals, making sure that the evidence from our public health tables and our science tables are, uh, are current and accurate and as best as, as anyone can bring to understand what's happening in long-term care and the measures we can take. We know that the previous neglect of many, many years in terms of the staffing crises, in terms of the wardrooms, played a role. Our government is committed and has been since the very beginning to make sure that we address the long-standing issues Response. so badly neglected. And every measure is being taken. The dollars are behind those measures. We will continue to support our, our staff, our residents in long-term care. They are the priority. We will continue. And the final supplementary. Families are watching, Speaker, as the second wave of this pandemic once again exposes a broken long-term care system. And this government has known for a couple of years now, as did the previous government, that that system was absolutely broken. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of reports that talk about what needs to be done. They haven't done it. 
Uh, they expose, this virus exposed the long-term care system that protects the, private, uh, the profits of four profit private companies. That's what it does. But it leaves residents vulnerable, alone, and dying in long-term care. For months, the Premier has promised an iron ring of protection around long-term care, but it's clear that he's not only failed to protect seniors in long-term care, he's ignored experts who warned for months that the second wave of this pandemic was going to be devastating for long-term care. So when will the government start being transparent with the people of Ontario and act with urgency that the crisis in long-term care demands? Premier to reply. Well, th th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I, I sit back and listen to the Leader of the Opposition and the Liberals criticize about long-term term care, when for 15 years, Mr. Speaker, they ignored long-term care. They had an opportunity to increase long-term care four hours a day of, of care for patients. They totally, totally ignored it. They watched the long-term care system for 15 years sure. crumble underneath sure. their feet. As we're going to lead the way, we're going to blaze a new trail with four hours of care for long-term care residents. Order. On top of that, Mr. Speaker, we're going to order, we're going to hire tens of thousands of PSWs, RPNs, and RNs. The leader of the opposition, come yes. to order. The leader of the opposition should have done it for 15 years and totally ignored the people. We're investing one. $1.7 billion in rapid builds to update the long-term care system that, again, was ignored for 15 years under the, the previous government and the Leader of the Opposition as, as they ended up supporting the Liberals. And we're also investing $540 million in investment to protect— Thank you very much. The official opposition will come to order. The next order. Member for Timmins come to order. Leader of the Opposition come to order. The next question, member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. This question is for the Premier. For months now, students, families, and education workers have been on a roller coaster as the government introduced a piecemeal plan that ignored expert advice on class sizes. Schools have been forced to collapse smaller classes into bigger ones, while this government is hoarding $9.3 billion in unspent COVID relief money that should have been used to keep them safe and keep those class sizes small. And now, just when families might be finally getting into some kind of routine, the Premier and the Minister of Education are causing all this uncertainty once again, Mr. Speaker, musing in the press about an early closure or an extended break. So will the Premier please tell us, and all the anxious families watching, if he's ready to shut down schools instead of capping class sizes at 15? Good Minister of Education to respond. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, according to the Chief Medical Officer of Health and leading medical experts across this country, schools in this province are safe. 99.96% of students do not have COVID. 99.86% of students have never had COVID. 99.7% of staff have never had COVID. 86% of schools do not have a case at all. Our plan in this province is keeping our kids safe, and we should be proud of our public health officials, of our doctors, of our teachers, and of our parents who have worked so hard to ensure we lead the nation in virtually every way. Now, Mr. Speaker, we are proud of, the, of, that, of our work. We're proud of that plan. But yes, we're working with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, as was asked by the Leader of the Opposition days ago. We are cognizant of community transmission rising. We have a duty to work with the Chief Medical Officer to scale up our plan, to make sure it responds to the risk, and to keep our kids safe in 2020 and beyond. And that is exactly what we're doing. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, it's like playing whack-a-mole trying to keep direct track of what direction this government is going in. The minister wants to talk percentages, but I'll tell you what parents are telling me. They're saying, our kids are not data points. Parents are interested in the 100 new cases a day that are taking place in our schools. Speaker, like the families at Begley Public School in Windsor, who are the latest to face an outbreak. The local public health unit has closed the school, and parents are now spending the day trying to get their kids tested, as are staff. They're praying they weren't exposed. Speaker, families are stuck between a plan that doesn't do enough to keep their kids safe and the threat of a full closure or a delayed return, and it's a false choice. It should never have come to this. If the Chief Medical Officer of Health recommends that schools stay open, as the minister has said, why won't the government cap class sizes so we can keep them that way? 
Minister of Education, respond. Mr. Speaker, it is quite obvious, according to uh, leading medical experts across this province, that our schools remain safe places for kids. The transmission is not happening within school, but fundamentally entering from community into our schools. And the data points, I think, need to um, inspire confidence in the population that 99.96% of students do not have COVID. The fact that of 4,800 schools, there are three close to the province. It only underscores that something special is happening in this province by the leadership of our frontline staff and our public health. And, Mr. Here. Speaker, let me add, in Quebec, when you compare our plan to the Remember next Davenport, jurisdiction in this order. province, they have 21 per cent of all cases in Quebec come from schools in Ontario, 7 per cent. They have half they have a million fewer students. We are doing something incredible in this province because of government, because of our teachers, because of our public health leaders. And yes, we will continue, as the Premier has made clear, build up our plan, make sure it leads the nation and it keeps every student and every staff safe in Ontario. Well said, yeah. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, over the years, I have heard countless individuals talking about businesses considering Ontario as a place to invest and create jobs. Unfortunately, for the longest time, they would end up going somewhere else due to the high commercial and industrial electricity prices. The source of the problem was high cost of contracts from electricity, from wind, solar, and bioenergy entered into by the previous government for electricity Ontario doesn't need at a price employers could not afford. Back in 2017, Jocelyn Bamford of Automatic Coating Limited said, in Toronto, I'm paying 19 cents a kilowatt hour, and with electricity being the third highest expense, when you look at the bottom line, it's very difficult to compete. According to the Fraser Institute, Ontario's soaring electricity costs led to nearly 75,000 manufacturing jobs losses since the end of the 2008 recession. While this was a major issue before COVID-19, it would be even more significant obstacle if the entire world focuses on recovering from the pandemic. Premier, what has the government done to help provide much-needed financial relief and stability for businesses regarding hydro costs? Thank you. The Premier to respond. The outstanding member from Etobicoke Lake Lakeshore is doing an incredible job. The member is 100 per cent correct. I heard the same message from businesses considering Ontario as a place to open up. But under the previous government, under the NDP, prices increased from 2008 to 2019, 118 percent. I know the leader of the opposition thinks it's funny that, that we increase uh, prices of electricity Order. for businesses, but I'll tell you, the businesses don't think it's funny. We're fixing the mess that we inherited from the previous governments, Mr. Speaker. We're removing the costs that will help industrial and commercial employers save about 14 to 16 percent, respectively, on the average electricity bills. Ontario will go from the least competitive electricity prices Spons? to prices that are more competitive than the U.S. average, who we're competing against day in and day out. We're finally, finally, after 15 years, fixing the electricity rate. Thank you very much. And there's a supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my supplemental question is back to the Premier. And it's time to get those jobs back to Ontario. And, Premier, along with members of this government, we are proud of the measures that we have taken since coming to office to help address this crisis. We repealed the Green Energy Act in order to stop the abuses. We wound down unneeded energy contracts, saving ratepayers of this province $790 million. Thanks to our new policy, this will provide even more savings and supports for many of my constituents and constituents from across Ontario. One of the examples of an automotive parts manufacturer in my riding could save $31,800 per month, or nearly wow. $382,000 annually. That's a lot of money. As a result of our comp comprehensive plan, Ontario will go from being one of the least competitive jurisdictions for the cost of electricity Question. to the most competitive, better than the U.S. average, and most Great Lakes states we compete with for manufacturing and commercial jobs. Speaker, can the Premier please share with us the reaction? What has the reaction been to our proposed hydro supports from businesses? And Thank you very much. And Premier, to reply again. Uh, member, I, I, I remember 
uh, what the member from Essex had to say back in 2017, stating, this is his quote, imagine if we thought about using hydro as a strategic investment to incentivize economic development in our communities, wouldn't that be great? Our member from Oshawa, or, or the member, not our member, it will be our member in 2022, or uh, from, from Oshawa, who warned in 2015, quote, Order. manufacturing and auto sector jobs will disappear with the rising cost of electricity. Well, ha haven't Order. we turned that around? We have all the auto manufacturers here just absolutely booming right now. And I want to close by quoting uh, from Flavio Volpe, president of the Auto Parts Manufacturing Response. Association. Here is what he had to say, quote, this would save some of our members a half a million dollars a year, but it's not just the savings for our members, it's about tr attracting new businesses here. Ha Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. The microphone goes off and we have to move on. The member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The report this morning from Ontario's Auditor General on this government's lack of action on the environment is scathing. The report shows this government and this Premier are failing to follow its own environmental laws. They're avoiding transparency, they're missing their own targets to reduce emissions, and they're failing to protect the environment. Clean water, clean air for Ontarians are at risk. The Auditor General doesn't mince any words, Speaker. She said, quote, it's concerning for us to report on the Environment Ministry's non-compliance. Why does, who does this government believe will benefit from the destruction of the environment? Mr. The Environment, Conservation and Parks. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker and the member opposite uh, for that question. And, you know, I read the uh, Auditor General's report this morning. I thank her very much uh, uh, for her work uh, and work for all Ontarians as she continues uh, throughout her years of service here to produce these reports. Uh, maybe the member opposite uh, was skimming through the pages or reading uh, uh, some blogs, but uh, if you actually read the report, uh, the Auditor General does state that there were no non-compliance issues with regards to the EBR. We met the timelines for posting on the EBR, Mr. Speaker. And um, with respect uh, to the water, Ontario has the uh, highest water uh, uh, regulations in the entire country, Mr. Speaker, and of the half a million tests done uh, through residents throughout the entire province, 99.9% .9 of those tests uh, met the standards set by the province of Ontario. We're proud of our action on water in this province. Which we can continue uh, to work uh, through our agencies like Aqua to ensure that municipalities are able to run uh, their water systems uh, appropriately. And I just want to thank Aqua for getting up up into uh, uh, not a sangha, excuse me for that pronunciation. But they got the thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Again, to the Premier, no minister who's read that report can be proud of the work that they're doing. None. None. The report says there simply aren't enough staff in the Environment Ministry to do the work necessary to protect the environment for Ontarians. After the previous government took little to no action, this government has cut so much that work simply isn't being done. The report's clear. The government doesn't even know if it's protecting endangered species. They can't take care of park planning and protected lands that are supposed to be in place to preserve our pristine natural beauty are being ripped apart for a quick buck. It's no surprise that a government that wavers on climate change as to whether or not it's really happening is not committed to the protection of the environment. But that's no excuse. Why is the government failing Ontarians when it needs to be protecting our air, our water and our climate? I ask the members to please take their seats. Minister of the Environment, to reply. Well, thanks uh, again for that question, Mr. Speaker. There's so much uh, to unpack from that statement. Uh, um, you know, I, where, where do we start, Mr. Speaker? We have an uh, environment plan uh, that we brought forward Order. in 2018 to protect our land, air, and water. Uh, we have made uh, important uh, initiatives going forward. We've moved to uh, uh, missions testing on heavy-duty vehicles. We have our EPS, Emission Performance Standards, approved by the federal government we'll be moving forward so that Ontario has an Ontario plan to reduce the emissions in our industrial sector while remaining competitive, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 
the budget that's proposed in uh, this legislature, if the member opposite uh, supports it, uh, $20 million will be going to work with uh, organizations like Nature Conservancy Canada to protect and preserve more land. Not, here, here. not since the, uh, the days of Premier Mike Harris has land been protected uh, throughout this province that we will be protecting here, here Mr. Speaker. Prince Edward County, we Opposition come to order. that we're looking at a Response. new conservation reserve, Mr. Speaker. The government, previous, supported by the NDP, did nothing with regards to protecting land throughout this government. We're doing it. We're only two years in. Just watch us go, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, good morning, Mr. Speaker, and thank you. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, on October 15th, about a month ago, after reports of flu vaccine shortages, uh, the minister uh, stood up in this House and did a number of media interviews and said that there were no shortages in pharmacies across Ontario. This morning, at 8.30 o'clock, 8.30 this morning, there is not a single shopper's drug mart in Orleans that has flu shot uh, availability, Mr. Speaker. Rexall's website reads, and I quote, Unfortunately, flu appointments have been cancelled due to the province-wide supply issues. And this morning, Mr. Speaker, there is at least a one-week's wait for a flu vaccination appointment with Ottawa Public Health. We're now six or seven weeks into the flu campaign. campaign. Can the Speaker explain why his flu campaign the centerpiece of the COVID-19 response plan had no prioritization for seniors and why people with serious heart disease, heart disease and diabetes are still waiting to get their flu shot. The speaker can't explain, but perhaps the Minister of Health can. Uh, in fact, this has been the largest flu campaign in Ontario's history. It was one of the central tenets of our fall preparedness plan. And I thank the people of Ontario for coming forward to protect their own health, the health of their families and their co-workers' friends. This is really important that we've spent over $70 million. We ordered f uh, over 5 million flu doses. Generally speaking, at this time of the year, there have been over, about uh, 500,000 flu shots administered through pharmacies. This year, over 1.4 million doses. So we are continuing to roll out this plan. We have had conversations with both the uh, federal minister, Minister Haidu. I've spoken with her about obtaining more vaccines from the Federal Reserve, as well as with private manufacturers. And I could advise that as of yesterday, we have received a shipment of another 142,000 doses from Sanofi. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I appreciate that, but the question was about prioritizing people with uh, heart conditions and diabetes. Uh, there hasn't been much good news coming out of the provincial government lately, Mr. Speaker, but there is finally good news about a COVID-19 vaccine. Thankfully, the federal Liberal government has taken a leadership role in procuring millions and millions of doses, millions of order. doses of vaccine uh, for Canadians, more, order. more than we'll ever need. More than we'll ever. Stop the clock. Okay. Member for Orleans has the floor. He has every right to ask his question without interruption. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. Member for Orleans, I apologize for the interruption. Mr. Speaker, throughout the process, the federal Liberal government has been transparent about its strategy to procure uh, the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. On the other hand, Mr. Speaker, here in Ontario, uh, the people of Ontario and this legislature still don't order. know how the province is going to distribute the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine uh, to Ontarians and what the priority is going to be. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier or the Minister of Question. Health confirm how many doses of COVID-19 we expect here in Ontario and what the plan will be and what the prioritization will be to get those into the arms of Ontarians? Minister of Health. In fact, just first of all, with respect to the flu vaccine, we did prioritize people in long-term care homes, people in hospitals, people living in congregate settings because we know that they are our most vulnerable and they need to be protected. Similarly, we will do the same with respect to the uh, COVID vaccine when it becomes available. We are expecting that we will receive shipments from both Pfizer and Moderna. We have the, our significant issues with respect to the Pfizer vaccine in particular. It needs to be stored at minus 75 degrees Celsius and Moderna minus 20. 
The doses for Canada, we expect to receive 4 million doses between January and March of the Pfizer vaccine, 2 million for Moderna, of which we anticipate that we will receive 1,600,000 of Pfizer and 800,000 of Moderna. People do have to be Spons? received two, vote, two doses 21 days apart. This is a major logistical challenge, but we have an entire group within the Ministry of Health right now that are planning for that. So as soon as we receive those shipments from the federal government. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Yes, thank you, Speaker. My, uh, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. As we know, last week's budget announced billions of dollars to various industries and businesses. In the early days of COVID-19, the province identified essential workplaces that needed to remain open. Among those were the mills, the processing facilities of Ontario's forestry industry. While we stayed home, Ontario's forestry industry and the men and women that work in that industry kept on working to make sure we had the materials we need, like uh, personal protective equipment, for example, to keep us safe. With that being said, Speaker, many businesses experienced added costs that came with keeping their facilities open. Through you to the Minister, Speaker, what is the government doing to ensure that our forestry sector is getting the support it needs to keep workplaces safe throughout this pandemic? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry to respond. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Haldeman Norfolk for his great question as well. And this government sees the forest industry as a priority industry. In fact, we were the first to declare it an essential industry when the pandemic hit. So we were helping companies with some, uh, with some of the added costs associated with keeping their places clean and safe. We've worked with the federal government to secure $5.3 million dollars through the Forest Sector Safety Measures Fund announced in last week's budget. This fund will ensure funding will go to eligible participants that operate small to medium-sized forestry companies in Ontario that have incurred at least $1,000 in eligible costs like PPE, additional cleaning, and other related costs between April 1, 2020 and February 1, 2021. Speaker, the health and well-being of Ontarians is the number one priority of this government. And that's why Response. we're giving support to address these added costs while keeping our forestry workers safe while they remain on the job to provide much-needed products for everyone in Ontario. And the supplementary question. <clears throat> thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you, Minister, for that response. And I think it's fantastic to see this government supporting Ontario's forestry sector with these critical funds. Our forestry sector is a key part of Ontario's economy. It is essential, and it's keeping our province functioning during this global pandemic. I see it firsthand in southern Ontario, across uh, my riding in Haldeman, Norfolk. I think of uh, Townsend Lumber, Arnold Hansen and Sons, uh, Porter Lumber have operated for years just down the road from my uh, farm. And companies like this contribute to our economy. They provide good playing jobs, certainly people in my riding and communities right across, right across the province. Speaker, can the minister tell this House just how important this sector is to the livelihoods of people in Ontario and to our economy? Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, thank you very much, and thanks to the member for that supplemental question. And it's, it's always a pleasure to speak in this House about the importance of the forestry sector here in the province of Ontario. It was one of the foundational bedrock industries in the opening of this province. The vital role that the forestry sector plays has been especially evident during the COVID-19 pandemic. The industry has a huge role to play in providing essential forest products for hygiene, medical supplies, food packing, shipping materials. This sector is critical to the provincial economy, especially in Indigenous, Northern and rural communities. I come from one of those communities, so I understand absolutely just how important it is. It generates over $18 billion in revenue, supports approximately 147,000 direct and indirect jobs across the province from Toronto to Timmins. Speaker, this sector is critical to getting through this pandemic. They haven't Spons? stopped working throughout this pandemic. Our government won't stop working to make sure that they have the supports that they need. Next, we have the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Last week, using his power under Section 22 of the Health Protection and Promotion Act, the Niagara Chief Medical Officer implemented a regulation that restricted restaurants to only allowing six guests from the same household to a table. The following Monday, this Conservative government implemented a regulation further reducing that to a maximum of four people. The Premier knows that Niagara is a tourist destination. We depend on our restaurants and bar industry. In fact, 13% of all jobs in Niagara are tied directly to the sector, which doesn't include thousands of spin-off jobs. These businesses cannot survive without financial help. The Premier holds the power in his hands. Will the Premier stand up today, tell the restaurant and bar owners of Niagara that he hears their cries for help, and immediately announce emergency funding to ensure they can weather the storm with these mandatory public health restrictions? Minister of Heritage, Heritage, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the member opposite's question. Obviously, Ontario, Ontario's number one, Canada's number one tourism destination is Niagara Falls. That's why this government has invested so much money into the Niagara Parks Commission $25 million loan early in the pandemic. I visited his riding. We were able to open up early uh, a Metrolinx uh, round trip. And we've just announced uh, this government is, is uh, allowing $300 million to businesses in hot zones like Niagara Falls and like my own city of Ottawa. I'm pleased that the member opposite is actually raising an issue on tourism. He had 30 minutes yesterday in estimates. Not one peep did he mention to me about any concerns that he had with respect to Niagara Falls. In fact, I had to actually call the mayor of Niagara Falls last night to let him know that this government, this party, this premier stands for the people of Niagara Falls. A supplementary question. My question was to the Premier, uh, not the Minister, but I'm sure she'll hear some questions today. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, restaurants and bars are reaching out to elected officials for their help, and I'm echoing their voice in this House to the Premier directly. Directly. When we hear about the regulations from the region, myself, my fellow NDP MPPs in Niagara immediately wrote to the Premier asking for emergency financial help for these businesses. Order. They don't want to close, but they want to be open serving their guests and our tourists. But if they're going to close, then the Premier has an obligation to make sure they don't close permanently and drown in debt. And I want the Minister to hear this, because she'll hear about it me today. We're waiting five days for a response, Mr. Speaker, from the Premier. Five days Question. too many. Speaker, will the Premier answer that letter right now and, and look into the camera and tell the restaurant and bars of Niagara that help is on the way? Tell them that he'll be using his powers today to help them survive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister to reply. Speaker, yesterday the members opposite had an opportunity for 30 minutes to talk about tourism. They refused to uh, utter the word tourism. Member for Niagara member Falls, come to order. The number one tourism destination in the entire country, and has the first time since this pandemic hit has now just raised an issue. Minister of Niagara Falls will come to order. I apologize to the Minister of Heritage. I'll give you a couple of extra seconds. <laughs> Minister of Heritage to reply. Thanks very much, Speaker. Now that he's been appointed minister, maybe I could ask him a couple of questions. Why did it take you so long to finally start raising these issues after eight months uh, onto the floor of this House? This government is absolutely committed to working with Restaurants Canada, the Ontario uh, Re Restaurant Hotel Management Association, uh, to make sure that we are able to proceed after COVID-19 with many of these uh, institutions within our province. We will be uh, continuing to engage in hyperlocal marketing uh, through the Destination Ontario Agency which uh, is responsible to me to support these, uh, these critical infrastructure across the province, including restaurants. And again, I want to reiterate Response. the Minister of Finance recently announced $300 million to support businesses just like this. Thank you, Speaker, for the opportunity. The next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question goes to the Premier. He said he's sparing no expenses. He said he'd build an iron ring around long-term care homes. He says he'll follow medical advice. My question is very simple. Why hasn't he? Minister of Health to reply. He has. 
The, the Premier has indicated since the very beginning that the health and well-being of the people of Ontario have been and will be our most important priority, and he has been listening to the science and the clinical evidence. He's been following the advice that's been given by Dr. Williams, by the Public Health Measures Table, by Public Health Ontario, and all of the people in behind that, because there are dozens of physicians that are supplying advice and recommendations through those bodies. That is what we are making our decisions based on, and that is what we will continue to decide upon, because those are the most important issues, and those are the people that are on the ground that know that what's actually happening out there. We always said we would listen to them, and we always will do that. And the supplementary question. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Health tweets out the new and rising number of COVID-19 uh, cases in Ontario. Yet, never included in those communications is the number of deaths included or related to COVID-19. Instead, it is left up to reporters to ensure that information is shared on that important platform. Order. My question is, again, very simple. Why is the minister not communicating this vital information in her daily reports? Minister of Health. This information is provided on the daily information available on our COVID website. The, all of the information that people want to know about the number of cases, the incidence rate, sadly, the number of deaths. That is not something that I believe is tweetable. I have respect for the people who have passed away, respect for their families. That is information that people can obtain, but I don't think it's a matter that we should be tweeting about. Well said. The next question, the member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the President of Treasury Board. In my writing of Mississauga Malton, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed that Ontario's programs and frontline services need to be more convenient, reliable, and accessible. Recently, the province announced a bold plan, Ontario Onwards, Ontario's COVID-19 action plan for a people-focused government to make government work more effectively for the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this is a welcome news. A simpler, better, and faster service are always important, more so during this pandemic. I'm very excited to be part of a team that makes government services more digital, ac digitally accessible, reduce red tape, and simplify policies for all Ontarians. Through you, Mr. Speaker, could the minister please tell the House and all Ontarians about these exciting and critical advancements in our public services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator of the Treasury Board, reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Mississauga Malton for that excellent question. With more and more people uh, accessing digital services, Mr. Speaker, we can't afford to be an offline government in an online world. The government is listening to Ontarians and exploring how programs and services can be improved. We've worked hard to create a better experience for the people of Ontario. Now, while this work preceded the pandemic, COVID-19 meant we had to accelerate and innovate our approach to moving Ontario onwards. Mr. Speaker, in Ontario's 2020 budget, our government launched the $500 million Ontario, uh, Ontario Acceleration Fund. The fund will reinvest in public services and will accelerate transformation across government. Mr. Speaker, we are modernizing the entire government. Mr. Speaker, we are moving Response. Ontario onwards. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. It is great to hear how the government of Ontario is improving the way stakeholders interact with the government. I know the people and the business in my riding will be thrilled to hear that government is prioritizing programs and services that will impact their day-to-day -day life. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the Acceleration Fund will encourage an accelerate transformation across government by supporting innovating ideas and providing opportunities to pilot these new technologies. Mm -hmm. To the thinkers, to the innovators from Mississauga Malton, I'm here to say we are looking forward to your calls. We are excited to help and we are excited to serve. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the President of Treasury Board tell the House about the people of how the people of Ontario will get help from this acceleration fund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. President of the Treasury Board, Mr. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the uh, member for this important question. The world has changed, Mr. Speaker, and the government must change with it. The new Ontario Onwards Acceleration Fund will help the implementation of projects that will make a difference in how people and businesses experience services in Ontario. One of the plan's signature projects is a digital identity wallet. 
This will allow people to safely and securely keep digital versions of physical IDs on their devices. A small business owner, Mr. Speaker, can register for licenses and permits and open accounts online. Ontario farmers could choose to renew a farm vehicle online. Mr. Speaker, we are expanding the range of programs and services available online, simplifying the government's role in people's lives and their businesses, and putting Spons. the people, Mr. Speaker, at the centre of everything we do. Thank you. The member for Beaches East York. Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Premier. My private member's bill, Bill 83, a day of remembrance and action on Islamophobia, passed second reading unanimously in April 2019. Many government MPPs, including the now Minister of Education and the government whip, spoke wholeheartedly in favour of that bill. But now the Premier is planning to give a notorious Islamophobe the right to grant university degrees and write and write Islamophobic curriculum that will warp the worldview of every student exposed to it. The massacres of Muslims in mosques in both Quebec City and Christchurch, New Zealand, were influenced by Islamophobic mischaracterization of Islam and Muslims. Schedule 2 of Bill 213 amounts to an attack on Muslim communities across Ontario. Will the Premier delete it from the bill? Thank you. Minister of Colleges and Universities to respond. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And you know, further to the Premier's comments yesterday, let me add this. There is absolutely no place for Islamophobia or homophobia, here, here. for that matter, in this province. But where there is an absolute place in this province, then there always will be in this country, is upholding the rule of law, upholding the Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms that require equality, that require all forms of equality be maintained under the principles of fundamental justice, procedural fairness. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure what the members opposite don't understand. Mr. Speaker, through you, it seems to me either A, they just want to play politics, they want to mislead the public, yep. or they can ask the minister to withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Um, I, I'm happy to withdraw, Mr. Speaker. But I must say, I, I really don't know what it is that they're after at the end of the day. They understand clearly that there Response. is equality. They must appreciate that fairness is important, Mr. Speaker. I trust they do actually appreciate it. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And no, it's not about procedural fairness. The bill actually seeks to subvert the usual arm's length process and procedural fairness. If the Premier cares about procedural fairness, he will remove Schedule 2 from the bill. Charles McVitie is also notoriously homophobic and transphobic. The baseless vitriol he has spewed towards queer people is likely to appear in the curriculum he will de develop for these university degrees he wants to give. Speaker, I am the proud mother of a gloriously wonderful trans daughter. I couldn't be prouder of her. I am also terrified of the consequences of transphobic attitudes and the pain and violence to which they sometimes lead. And I know that other parents, friends, and families of trans Ontarians feel the same way. This is Trans Awareness Week. On this week, Question. of all weeks, how can the Premier tell trans Ontarians, their families and loved ones, that he is legislating more transphobia into the province? Will the Premier delete Schedule Members, will please take your seat. Minister of Colleges and Universities to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there it was, right at the beginning of the, uh, of the I guess it was an answer. Uh, that, that was it. That's the critical point. The opposition, both the Liberals and the NDP, continually ask us to interfere with the rules. They continually ask us Order. to interfere with procedural fairness. They continually ask us to somehow restrict the rules. There is no basis to interfere with Order. the process, Mr. Speaker. The process is set for a reason because opposition it is transparent. Come to order. I heard the leader uh, of the opposition say in her first question of the day, she commented on transparency. She talked about wh wh why, we, wh why we wouldn't want transparency. This is the most transparent thing that could exist. This is the most procedurally fair process that can exist, Mr. Speaker. This school applies order. directly to an independent the body order. with no ministerial involvement whatsoever, and we've put it in legislation so that it could be openly debated in a transparent and accountable way. There is no clearer way, Mr. Speaker. Order. The next question, the member for Cambridge. 
very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Two days ago, Elections Canada sent a communication stating that they do not use Dominion voting systems for federal general elections, adding they use paper ballots counted by hand in front of scrutineers. But the 2018 Ontario election saw Dominion voting machines used in 50 per cent of polling locations. Prior to the 2018 election, the Ontario PC party wrote to Elections Ontario with concerns regarding whether the machines were protected from hacking and about the certification process. Can the minister tell us whether these concerns have been alleviated? And if he knows whether Elections Ontario plans to replace counting ballots by hand with Dominion machines in all polling locations for the 2022 election. The parliamentary assistant and member for Durham to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Um, we're proud of the robust election system, uh, independent election system we have in the province of Ontario. Um, and, and we would not interfere with that process as the government in power. Um, I encourage the, the member opposite to continue to draw any uh, concerns she has to Elections Ontario, an independent body, um, so that they can properly address them. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, machines and elections, not just from Dominion, have been reported in the Canadian media as having issues with quote-unquote glitches. The 2014 election in New Brunswick saw results stop for 90 minutes due to a computer program mal malfunctioning. In 2018, online voting system used in 51 of the 194 Ontario municipalities experienced problems that delayed voting. In 2020, the Conservative Party of Canada, for their leadership, used machines that ended up chewing up thousands of ballots that had to be recreated in order to be fed into the Dominion voting machines. My question, if voting machines that replace people to count and scrutinize sometimes experience glitches that make voters uncomfortable, do the benefits in using machines really outweigh the costs? The uh, member for Durham to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, any allegations of uh, fraud in an elections process uh, we take very seriously, and I know Elections Ontario takes very seriously. They are an independent body. It's appropriate that any concerns you have be drawn to Elections Ontario. That's the proper process. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. I'm going to keep it brief in the interest of getting my friend from Hamilton East Stony Creek also on the agenda today. Uh, as the province's seniors critic, I'm very well aware, Speaker, that seniors need flu vaccines in this moment. And as of November 12th, there are no flu vaccines in our city. We currently do not have supply to meet even half of Ontario's seniors. We would, like, we would like an explanation from this government about why it's so massively underordered during a pandemic high dose flu vaccines for seniors. Mr. Health to reply. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. And in fact, we did order uh, over a million doses more this year than last year. We have had a very, very successful flu campaign, as I indicated earlier. I'm very happy that the people of Ontario are taking this seriously to do whatever they can to uh, take care of their own health, the uh, health of their children and their families and, and friends. We did prioritize our flu vaccines when they first came in to our seniors in long-term care homes, in retirement homes, other places of congregate living, people in hospitals, and so on. We ordered more of the high-dose flu vaccines again this year than last year, uh, but we, uh, because it's been so successful, we are ordering more. And as I indicated earlier, we are just receiving another 142,000 doses through Sanofi. We're looking at other global manufacturers, and we have requested further flu vaccines from uh, the federal government from their uh, from their available reserves. That's your question. Thanks, Speaker. There are 4.6 million seniors in Ontario. We normally want a utilization rate of 70 per cent. Half that dose, Minister, does not, does not get us there. Uh, practitioner in our writing, Dr. Ali Khan Abdullah, Speaker, has 1,000 seniors Order. in his practice. Guess how many high-dose vaccines he has for them, Speaker? 30. 30. What is Dr. Abdullah supposed to do? Hold a raffle? For the 30 high dose vaccines those 1,000 seniors need? Minister, you need to do much better. We need to double, quintuple, sextuple the amount of orders you. People need these vaccines. What can you tell seniors today about getting these flu vaccines now? Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Well, what I can tell you is that these flu vaccines have to be ordered almost a year before they're required. We anticipated an increase in dosages this year 
from last year, long before COVID-19 ever came along. So we ordered over 5 million doses. We've received 5 million doses. We know that people want to receive more, and we are working around the clock to find more, both through the federal government's vaccine pandemic warehouse, but also we've received 142,000 doses from Sanofi, and we are working with other manufacturers to get more doses in as soon as possible because we know that more people want to receive them. So we are doing our best to receive them. We are searching literally around the world to get them, and we will get them in, as we've seen with the uh, recent um, delivery by Sanofi. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. The Conservation Authorities Act gives municipal councils the power to appoint all members of the Conservation Authority for the watershed in which they are located. In Bill 229, however, the government requires members appointed by municipal councils to be elected representatives. In other words, city councillors will be forced to nominate themselves to the Conservation Authority. If councillors wanted to appoint themselves to conservation authorities, they could have done so already, and they probably have good reasons not to do so. So why does this government believe it is necessary to once again interfere in the affairs of municipalities and force municipal councillors to appoint themselves to conservation authorities, something they obviously have no desire to do? First part, the Minister of the Environment. Well, thanks uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and for that question from the member opposite. Uh, you know, last year we uh, began a consultation process uh, with regards to conservation authorities. Uh, I met personally uh, with almost every conservation authority in, in Ontario here in Toronto. Uh, if, if I wasn't there, my PA was there or some of my staff. Following that, uh, we crossed the uh, province uh, having broad consultations with so many different stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, we had tables where landowners were sitting beside conservation authority, beside municipal councillors. We had three, uh, four of them across the province, over 500 people approximately attended almost every event. And we took in a lot of uh, online submissions for conservation authority. And, and one of the, uh, the uh, main issues that came forward was accountability. Uh, and transparency with regards to conservation authorities. And one of these moves we're doing forward is to ensure that those elected members of council will sit on the conservation authority Response. to ensure there's fiscal responsibility, but also responsibility for the environment within <coughs> excuse me, their municipalities, Mr. Speaker. Public members can still participate in conservation authorities. We hope they set up a public. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bill 229 also modifies the Conservation Authorities Act to give the minister greater power to overrule permit decisions made by conservation, conservation authorities in Ontario, diminishing their power to protect Ontario's watershed and wetlands. Again, I recognize the importance of working with municipalities and developers to help move development, development forward. However, the environment cannot take a back seat to the economy. The two must go hand in hand. Conservation authorities were created with the explicit task of conserving, restoring, developing, and managing the natural resources in Ontario's watershed, and they've been doing that very effectively. In this House, however, yesterday, to a question asked by the member for Guelph, the government said that the proposed changes to the Conservation Authorities Act would protect the environment question. better by centralizing power in the hands of the government. Can the minister please explain how, by passing and overriding those tasks with managing our watershed in a sustainable manner, could possibly help them achieve their purpose? The government House Leader will withdraw his unparliamentary remark. Up and clearly state. I withdraw. Minister of the Environment. And uh, for uh, that question, and it, I'll just uh, correct uh, correct the member, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what was missing in the conservation authorities was any amount of appeal in the process. Their, their word, and that was the end of the road. They could go to the land tribunal, but that took too long. So we're instituting an appeal mechanism with regards to LPAT, Mr. Speaker, so that it can get uh, a second uh, view because. Consistency was what was missing throughout the province of Ontario. Some conservation authorities were going beyond what was the rules and regulations of the promises, instituting their own rules, which, Mr. Speaker, wasn't correct. Uh, so what we've allowed also, and uh, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry on per, uh, provincially significant land, 
can, in fact, issue a permit. But he has to follow the same rules of Section 28 that conservation authorities have to follow, and our scientists here at the Legislature will be looking at that. Mr. Speaker, if Response. a member opposite is asking if we will remove the protections that were in place to ensure that their leader got a free pass to build a pool to avoid the rules of the Conservation Authority, we're not going to let that happen, Mr. Speaker. We're going to end those. Thank you. Thank you. The House will come to order. The next question, member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture. As a critic for the official opposition in sports and tourism, it's my job to hold the government to account. If I can't receive a proper response from the minister, then the government is doing a disservice to the people of Ontario. Since February, prior to the March lockdown, I've been working with various provincial sports organizations who are looking for answers. Over the past nine months, I've sent many official letters to the minister addressing the concerns of the sports community and have not received one single response. I brought some of these letters along with me today, lots of them, and uh, I have a copy, a detailed copy report which I submitted to the minister uh, in April. Haven't heard a word, uh, a large report. Member Cantwer, use props. Place your question. Why has the minister and her office refused to respond to any of my inquiries? Has she been asked not to respond? And uh, the House Leader stands up every day in this House and says, we want to cooperate with you. I don't think so. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Speaker, I'm going to be brief so the minister, the member opposite can have his supplemental. He doesn't get a lot of chances over there, and I really respect oh. the member opposite. So uh, I'll respond to his answers today. We'll, we'll chat after a uh, question period. I'll ask my correspondence unit uh, that why, why there's been a delay. We've been working extremely hard in sport to make sure that uh, we can get children back uh, into play. We've been flowing lots of money, over $28 million, to uh, high performance and, and amateur athletes. And I'm looking forward to estimates today, where I do hope the, uh, the word sport Sports is actually uttered by the official opposition. Supplementary question. Well, interesting answer, not. Stakeholders in the tourism industry has also asked for my assistance on getting a response from the minister. Most recently, Michael Wood from Ottawa Special Events spoke with me along with more than 25 other political representatives at all levels of government about the serious problems facing the tourism industry. If federal leaders like Minister Catherine McKenna, Minister Mona Forte are able to set aside time to speak with people like Michael, why has the minister in charge of her, his industry not been able to offer the same level of support and open communication in her own city? This portfolio represents billions in revenues and hundreds of thousands of Ontario jobs. Should there not be some accountability on how it is being managed? At this point, it feels like I'm just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Minister to reply. The, uh, the member opposite, uh, if he's been following the portfolio, would recognize that I had not one, not two, not three, but 12 telephone town halls across the province, spent 11 weeks on tour across Ontario, safely traveling and exploring and experiencing places just like his hometown of Hamilton, where I was there to announce money for uh, the Hamilton Art Gallery. Uh, speaker, I've also appeared before the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs, not once but twice, and yesterday I spent an hour in estimates, and I'll spend some more time, where the, the members opposite were not able to utter the words tourism or sport, which was very Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come So board. I've been more than accessible. I've had a, a telephone town hall with the Premier, uh, with my sectors, with the Finance Minister. I've had uh, the Minister of Associate Minister of Small Business actually attend uh, a, a consultation with me in my own community. I don't think that there's been a member of this Assembly who's consulted more Order. widely and broadly across this province during this pandemic than myself. And my Thank you. Thank you. The member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, will withdraw his unparliamentary remark. Okay, I withdraw the baloney part. Stand in his place and withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker.